Yeah, and as a matter of fact, uh, I went to uh, the 23rd District as a sergeant, uh, patrol sergeant, uh, and that's Wrigleyville. You know, great place to work. You know, there's yeah. there's still their crime in a lot of those areas. But you know, wow, summertime Wrigleyville. This is this is great. It was uh, <laughs> almost party central. Um, and what is? Let me just guess. What's in Wrigleyville? I'm I'm going to guess Wrigley Stadium. Uh, yeah, uh, the the ball field. So you know you've and you've got all the bars and the entertainment districts around that area. Yeah. Um, there was also Boys Town though. Um, that was the uh, the gay section of the city. You know, mm-hmm. um, and and that was cool. You know, I never a lot of guys were like homophobic, you know, yeah. you know, even a lot of the girls and they were afraid to like, oh, I'm not going into Wrigleyville into that bar. You know, that's a gay bar. So what, man, they're people too. Come on, you know? <laughs> and, uh, and yeah, you'd get hit on every now and then by a guy, you know, but, uh, I took it as a compliment. <laughs> <laughs> Got to feed that ego where you can, right? Yeah. yeah but I, I've, I've worked with guys who, who, man, they wanted to get out of there as quick as possible. It's like, yeah. Eh, Come yeah. on, it's it's no big deal. But uh, yeah, so okay. So now this was this was as a sergeant, right? And you're that's you're, right. And, and right after that, you know, I spent a couple of years there, and then I went over. I got back to the detective division as a sergeant, um, a homicide sergeant. Um, and again, this is what like we we're talking because of, of who you know who you've met along the way in your job. One of the detectives I worked with back in area four, um, started getting promoted up the line and he became the commander of uh, area five de- detective division. And he brought me over because he knew my work as a detective. We worked together uh, as detectives. And so I did some time there at, uh, area five and, uh, um, then it got promoted to lieutenant and again, sent back to patrol where my first, now at this time, <laughs> that same guy I knew as detective who made commander and brought me over to area five. He is now the first deputy superintendent of the police department. He's the number two guy in the police department. Wow. Uh, like I mentioned earlier, you know, the power behind the throne mm-hmm. and um, he, he made all the assignments and sent me to the 18th district. That's Cabrini green mm-hmm. where I met your cousin, but also I was the rush street lieutenant which is I was in charge of uh, the uh, small group of uh, coppers that uh, uh, police the entertainment district, Rush Street, okay. you know, which was I must have put on 30 pounds working there because you couldn't pay for a meal on Rush Street if they knew you were the police. Wow. Um, it was tough losing that weight, too, after I left. <laughs> you know, I, and I want to add one thing here. When you say you know these people and they've made it to certain positions, you know, this guy is now number two. It's not just that you know them, but you have earned their respect through the hard oh. work that you did. It's just not that you did somebody a favor and, and now they're going to take care of the rest of your life. Absolutely. Absolutely. He he put me in those spots because he knew he could trust me um, uh, and that I did good work. Yeah, that, absolutely. You know, those are the only reasons. If I didn't, and I've known a lot of detectives who worked with him also who got promoted, who didn't get that same consideration from him. Because he knew he didn't he trust them. Work one way or the, yeah, absolutely. Exactly. Yeah. So I'm sorry. Go back to your story. I just want to clarify that because this yeah. you have earned this this area that you're working in these promotions. Oh, yeah. um, but I hated it. You know that job was it from nine at night till five in the morning. You know I hated it. I, I just hated it. You know I'm away from my family. You know mm-hmm. you know I'm, I'm sleeping during the day when they're awake. I, I hated it, but everybody was like, "Oh my God, that's the greatest job!" Uh, no, it's not. Mm-hmm. You know, it was. I hated it. Yeah. But eventually, I went back being a watch commander in the 18th district. I got off that uh, entertainment uh, crew, and um, and from there, I was promoted to uh, uh, transferred uh, to Area Three Detective Division as the uh, commanding officer, uh, homicide lieutenant over there again, because that commander was my sergeant in area four. So wow. He, again, he knew my work. Now, so you're a lieutenant, but <clears throat> excuse me, but you're the commanding officer for that area. Who is, where's your captain? Um, we didn't have captains in the detective division any longer. That That's an old thing that kind of went, by the way, I had a commander above me of exempt rank. He wore the gold star. We wore silver stars. They okay. were like, <laughs> you can call them like 
the majors and the colonels and the generals, you know, yeah. uh, but um, you're getting up into the executive staff levels yeah, at that point. It's exactly, exactly what it is. We call them exempt because uh, they were no longer um, part of our same pension fund. They oh. had their own gold star pension fund, which was wow. a, ooh, which was a good one. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Wow. Yeah. But um, so now there, yes, there I was, com- I'm sorry, go ahead. I commanded the uh, homicide unit, the gang, the gang unit and the sex crimes unit in area three on the north side of the city. But I had a commander, the rank of commander above me. I mm-hmm. My rank was lieutenant, but I was also known as the commanding officer of that unit. That's, you know, that sounds like a lot of responsibility. You're over the homicide investigators, you're over the sex crime section, and you're over the gang crimes, which, you know, have a lot of experience in all of them. But it sounds like a lot of responsibility to put on one person. Yeah, it was. Um, but um, it was easier than I thought it was going to be because once you get that level of uh, other sergeants and detectives working with you, mm-hmm. um, those people are in their positions because they earned them also, mm-hmm. and they can be relied on. Um, my my biggest responsibility, as I saw it, was keeping the bosses above me away from my people so my people could do their work. Isn't that the truth? Yeah, that was I, I ran interference on a daily basis um, to let them be and let them work because this was a time in the police department when micromanaging was a big thing mm-hmm. where, where you'd have deputy superintendents sitting down next to a detective grilling him about what's going on with a case. Well, no, let him do his work. Let yeah. him do his work. Yeah, so, absolutely. It's, yeah. Uh, you know, it's the same way. It's the same way in the feds. You know, I, t- I can't tell you how many ass chewings I took as a, even as a, a GS-15, an assistant special agent in charge, to protect my guys so they could do their jobs. I'll take the grief. You go do your yeah. job. It's That's my yeah. job is to keep them away from you and to get you what you need so you can do yeah. your cases. I can't tell you how many times I was on a, on a homicide scene <laughs> and uh, my boss or his bosses were coming up to me. I'd see him walking towards me. I'd run to them and like kind of you know, put my arm around one of them and start steering them and walking them in a different direction away from the scene. Because one of the worst things in Chicago, and I don't know, I imagine it's that way in some other big cities too, is uh, scene contamination. Everybody wants to look at that body. Yeah. Everybody. It's like, you've got no business here. Really, look at the pictures or the video later. You've got no business on this scene contaminating my scene. Get yeah. out of here. You have nothing to offer. Right. Nothing. Nothing and everything to destroy. It's that is, yeah. and I think I think law enforcement is getting to the point now where they're really taking that serious. Oh that, yeah, finally. You know, yeah. But also, yeah. bosses think that hey, I'm I'm God now. I can do whatever the hell I want to yeah. do, and you can't stop me. Yeah, yeah. One of the big things that stops them, that really holds them up, though, is you you put that patrolman at the front door with a clipboard and yeah. a sign in sheet. Yep. Boss, you have to sign in before you enter. And a lot of them don't like doing that. No, no, I don't want to be here. <laughs> well, also, that could potentially get you thrown on a witness list at a trial. Absolutely. Yep. Absolutely. They don't want to be there. <laughs> <laughs> they don't want to be. When I was a lieutenant, I never walked into an interview room where a homicide suspect was. Never. Because I don't want to go to court anymore. Yeah. <laughs> That's not my job. I don't want to be on that witness list. We got cameras in there. They're going to see my face on camera in that room with that guy. Uh uh-uh, uh, ain't gonna yep. happen. Yep. <laughs> and then you're gonna get all these accusations. You walked in and coerced that guy, didn't you? Because now there's three yeah. of you good guys against one bad guy. Yeah, you, it's absolutely. just a form of court. I know. Just, this. just your physical presence is intimidating. Three against one. Yeah. You know? Yeah. It's uh, you know when it, when it comes to these defense attorneys, it's almost like smoking mirrors. Oh, absolutely, absolutely. <laughs> I'll tell you though, one of the best things that ever happened was putting cameras in our interview rooms we were against it in the beginning mm-hmm. uh, it it only happened once i became a lieutenant when they started putting cameras in interview rooms and uh we were uh we don't want the juries to see what we're doing in there we don't want to hear the the lies we're telling to these people mm-hmm. which is all completely legal but we don't want them to hear it it was the best thing the best thing that ever happened because the, the number of confessions didn't drop they actually increased and they were 
that on locks. There's nothing they could say, nothing any defense attorney can say. There's your cl- cl- client right on camera and audio confessing to the murder. Yeah. That's, you know, it's, uh, I remember a lawyer telling me in Miami, I think it was an, an assistant U.S. attorney down there, we're getting ready to go to trial. And, and, um, his quote to me was the best evidence you can have. And this, this kind of hurt my feelings, just to be honest with you. He said, the best evidence you can bring me is video. The second best is audio. Third best is your testimony. Yeah. And I'm thinking, yeah. man, I've been a cop. I'd been a cop for 12 years before I joined the feds. You know, I've been yeah. on a witness stand numerous times, had a very high percentage conviction rate. And you're telling me my, I'm third best. But when you start yeah. looking at it and you watch a jury and they see that on video, if you watch the jury every once in a while, you'll perceptively, just a little perception of them shaking their head like, yeah, this guy's going to prison. You know? <laughs> yeah. Not very often. you got to yeah. really watch for it, but yeah. you'll, see, you'll see it. <laughs> uh, and, you know, you hated to admit the, the prosecutor yeah. was right, but I guess he was. Yeah. But, but also when, you know, when the public and, and the lawyers, every, you know, whether they're prosecutors or defense attorneys and the judges see those videos, they realize you know what? These cops are doing a good job. They're not coercing. They're not beating people yeah. with a rubber hose like you get accused of your whole career. That's right. Yeah. You know, so it does bring a lot of credibility to it. You know, I guess we're kind of like dinosaurs. We're we're slow to change. We hate change. Oh, my God. We hate change. Yeah. But uh, I, I can see what you're talking about there. That's, yeah. that's pretty cool. Now, when we were talking a couple of days ago, you were telling me about a case that you were involved with. I, I think this is when you were the commanding officer over Area 3, and it involved a United States District Court judge. Uh, yeah. Um, it was uh, Judge Joan Lefkow. Um, she was a uh, federal judge, and um, her husband and her mother were murdered in their home uh, mm. after she had left for work um, that day. Uh, the way the story goes is. Um, she got up, went to work, came home, found her husband and mother dead. Her husband was an attorney. His office was in their basement. Um, mom was just an 80-something years old, sweet little old thing, murdered in the house, shot uh, several times with a small caliber handgun. So, this, was fe- this was February 2005, I believe, right? Correct, yeah. So immediately, we're, we're on the scene. Um, you know, I had to come in from home. And this is a big one, you know. I came in from home. My boss is there. The superintendent of the police, the number one guy in the police department is there. Crowds and crowds of, of coppers and my detectives. And um, I do a walkthrough of the scene real quick. You know, I don't want to be anything, see anything, touch anything. I saw the husband and the mother um, where they were. And um, it was obvious that the perpetrator or perpetrators cleaned up, mopped up blood uh, and stuff, uh, probably to hide footprints. Um, and when I walk outside, I see a bunch of people, my commander and the superintendent talking to a bunch of guys in suits. And right away, I assume, well, that's got to be the feds, uh, the FBI. <laughs> and I was right. And now this, as she was not the victim, nor did we have any indication she was the target <clears throat> at that time, it was our case. It was not the feds' jurisdiction, not the FBI's jurisdiction yet. But uh, the superintendent, of course, the FBI wanted in because they were relatively sure that uh, the judge was the intended target, and mm-hmm. they wanted in on the case. So, uh, of course, our superintendent invited them in. I mean, they have vast resources, and um, we wanted to take advantage of that. But, uh, of course, it was still our jurisdiction. Um, the reason the FBI thought the judge was the intended target is because she had been threatened in open court by a white supremacist named Matthew Hale, um, who ran a a church. He called it a church, but it was really just a white supremacist organization. And he was sued by another church of the same name. And um, it went to a, a civil trial in Judge Lefkow's courtroom, and she ruled against Matthew Hale and his church, and he had to give up the name. And uh, so he wound up threatening her in open court. Now, he was... Martin Ballou. Yeah, he was immediately arrested, of course, and he was incarcerated in the federal lockup in downtown Chicago at the time of this, this, uh, uh, these two murders of the judge's family. And so, rightly so, the, the FBI made the assumption that Matthew Hale may be involved in this or his people 
uh, from his white supremacist group might be involved in this. Mm-hmm. It's it's only logical to make that that leap that he could be the number one suspect. But as anybody who's ever worked homicides knows, just because you think he's looking good as the number one suspect doesn't mean he really is the perpetrator. Right. Don't get that tunnel vision. But the FBI did. They got that tunnel vision. Now, in the days that followed, I was shocked and amazed at what they did. Within 24 hours, they brought in 100 agents from around the country. Oh. Um, they set up in, in our uh, one of our large uh, rooms in our, in our uh, building, and they took it over. They put up a, a secure dish on the on the on the roof for uh, for internet, private internet access. Um, and brought in their computers and banks and banks of phones. They immediately announced a tip line for any information. Call this number, and they had all their a bunch of FBI agents answering the phones and the others running down phone tips. And all my detectives were assigned to run down these phone tips with the FBI. Well, that kind of degenerated over the next few days, whereas the detectives kept to themselves, the FBI agents kept to themselves. And this is one of the cases where I really lost all confidence in the FBI. For one, if you are, say, in a field office somewhere in Nebraska and you get a call, you got to send us two agents to Chicago working on this case. Same thing in San Diego or in San Francisco or on the East Coast somewhere, you got to send them two agents. Which two agents are you sending? Your deadheads, the dead weight. Absolutely. The worst, the worst of the worst. The ones you don't want to see around for weeks, hopefully months. Yep. You want this case to stretch out as long as you possibly can because you want to get rid of these guys. Well, you that's who they sent us. And you're certainly not going to send your home run hitters. Oh, no. No, no, no. And that's who they sent us. And, uh, oh, so many stories about the screw-ups these guys did. But, um, anyway, the FBI developed tunnel vision. This was it. We're like, okay, listen. We have to interview the judge, our detectives, our homicide, our seasoned homicide detectives have to interview the judge. We want to interview all her courtroom personnel. Um, we want to look into the husband's background. We even want to look into um, mom's background because her maiden name was Humphrey and she's from Minnesota. So she may be peripherally involved somehow with the Hubert Humphrey, mm-hmm. Senator Hubert Humphrey family. And who knows, but you just can't ignore it. Right. You just can't ignore anything at all in a homicide investigation. Well, we were denied. The the marshal service, rightly so, took uh, the judge into custody, uh, protective custody, and we weren't allowed any access, which was wrong. We should have had access, and they just you guys developed... weren't allowed access to the judge. No, not at all. We weren't allowed to talk to her at all. What the was FBI the reasoning said, there? The FBI said we're handling it. We're we're, we're going to interview her, and we're handling it. Well, my thought is, well, how many of you have investigated a homicide before? Exactly. How many of you know what questions to ask her? Did you ask her about um, any possible other people she might think uh, was threatening to her? Maybe not overtly, but, you know, some crazies in her, her courtroom. That's why we wanted to talk to the, uh, to the uh, uh, her courtroom personnel as well. We weren't mm-hmm. allowed to. We're not allowed to. We were just told follow up on your phone tips and they were giving us all these goofy phone tips so oh. eventually after a few weeks um this is going on and we're going anywhere well i start badgering my boss and his boss says we're doing this wrong you know we're doing this wrong they're they can't have tunnel vision like this sure i'm gonna give you that matt hale and his organization are good suspects let the fbi work on that let us work on the other stuff Mm-hmm. Let's do it. No, no, not yet. Uh, we can't. We can't step on their toes. I was told by my bosses we can't step on their toes. Finally, it got to the point where I told my boss's boss, and I had a relationship with it. I said, "Listen, this is crazy. This is going nowhere. These phone tips. Um, they have tunnel vision. Please let us work on." He goes, "Tomorrow, you can start working on it tomorrow. You can start working like it's a regular homicide tomorrow." Thank God. Mm-hmm. That night, <laughs> I'm at home. I get a phone call from my boss. You got to run up to Wisconsin. The guy, they got the guy. What do you mean they got the guy? Confession, signed confession, and a suicide note in his car. Well, what happened was this guy, his name was Bart Ross. He uh, just uh, some mope who, uh, an immigrant from Poland who uh, 
came over and um, heavy smoker developed cancer of the mouth. Mm -hmm. Had surgery. They saved his life. But he thought it disfigured him. Um, the surgery disfigured him. So he was suing his doctors and his own lawyers in federal court. And uh, Judge Lefkow had ruled against him. And so he held a grudge against her. He had a hit list. He was going to go hit all his doctors, hit the lawyers, and Judge Lefko was on his list. What had happened was he broke into a basement window um, on the night before the murders, was in a furnace room, which was right off the uh, husband's legal office in the mm -hmm. basement, brought some beer with him, drank his beer, and fell asleep. He woke up too late. He woke up because he heard the husband on the other side of the door, the lawyer, he walks out, obviously, hey, what are you doing in my house? Pow, mm -hmm. pow, shoots him. Grandma comes downstairs, hears the loud noises, boom, boom, caps her on the, on the stairs, and he leaves. Wow. He's driving around in a van going up to Wisconsin where he found out, found the address of one of the doctors that operated on him. And uh, he gets pulled over in the middle of the night by a patrolman from West Dallas, Wisconsin, which is a suburb of Milwaukee. And as the patrolman is walking up to the car, he, boom, there's a gunshot. He feels the whiz of the bullet go by his head. Just missed him. And there's a guy dead in the car, committed suicide. Now, he had no idea what this was all about because we had no idea this guy was a possible suspect. And uh, in the car is a suicide note. Uh, in the gun he used in the murders is in the car. Uh, eventual search warrant on his apartment finds uh, matching rounds for his gun, other evidence. Um, he test fired his weapons into a phone book in there, and uh, the rounds matched. Um, also, um, during the original investigation, there was DNA found on a cigarette in a drain in a basement, um, and that was confirmed that it was him in the house. Yeah. But here, the FBI, a day or so later, throws a party that we're all invited to for the successful conclusion of this investigation. And I'm thinking to myself, this is a joke. This, this is no successful conclusion. We've closed the case, yes. But how can you call it a successful conclusion when, when we didn't have a clue because of what I thought was the FBI's ineptitude? Now, maybe we never would have got this guy's name from the judge or from the court personnel. But at least we should have been given the opportunity to try mm -hmm. to do our investigation. And it really ticks me off. And it left a sour taste in my mouth since the uh, <laughs> with the FBI since then. Yeah. Yeah. And, uh, you know, love our FBI, brother, FBI brothers and sisters. But, you know, you do hear these stories, it seems like, repeatedly. Uh, even during the Boston Marathon bombing, we had the uh, commissioner of the of the uh, Boston Police Department on here. And, of course, his name escapes me when I need it for it, and it's not popping out at me. Anyway, we had him on the show, and you know, he talked about the challenges they had working with the Bureau during that, the, during those, uh, the bombings up there during the marathon. And thank God it all worked out, uh, but I don't know. Yeah, I, I don't want to group every every FBI special agent into that group. Um, in fact, I blame the ASACs and the SAC more than the uh, field agents. Absolutely. Um, um, for their tunnel vision, but really left an hour to <laughs> say. Yeah, it, it does. And it's it was Commissioner uh, Ed Davis. I don't know, and Ed, I'm sorry, I couldn't think of your name, brother. I'm, I'm getting old. What the hell can I say here? <laughs> but I want to ask you back. So the patrolman in Wisconsin pulls the, this guy over. When the guy killed himself, did the bullet go? Th did he shoot himself in the mouth or the head or in the head? Yeah, side of the head. Boom, through and, and through his head. Nine millimeter went all the way through, and then almost struck the police officer. Yes, yes. Well, I'm, I'm guessing he wasn't using those lead bullets that Chicago PD <laughs> answers <laughs> no, issues. I, no, I, I don't think so. <laughs> wow. But, uh, you know, we've been. Uh, I used to run a, a mobile enforcement team for DEA out of the Atlanta division. We were in North Carolina, and we'd done a like a five or six month deployment working undercover, and, and we're doing the takedowns. And, and these guys that were going after the first group were known to be armed and dangerous and all that kind of stuff. And so we brought in the local sheriff's SWAT team, and there the 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 main guy lives in this mobile home, 
but it was out on private property and it had it fenced off and he had pit bulls in there between the house and the fence and all that. So, you, you know, there were several things that they had to contend with before they could actually get to make, kick that front door in. Well, several hundred yards behind it was another mobile home and, and they were used, using that also. So I took my team down there and we were going to hit them simultaneously. Well, as they make entry, we're moving down this dirt road and, you know, we got our vests on our helmets and all that. And, and uh, we hear gunshots behind us, and the next thing you hear is rounds whizzing by our head. Ooh. So we all hit the ground, and, you know, they got in a, a shooting with a guy in there, and, and the cops had the MP5s, and uh, rounds were going through that little trailer coming down range. Oh, 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 oh. It's it's a extremely uh, – it yeah. will make you want to go change your pants, let me tell you. It's, oh, yeah. It's not a comfortable feeling at all. But I, so I'm, I'm, I'm kind of sympathizing with that patrol officer because – Yeah, <laughs> and – that's one of the things that really ticked me off, too, is because if this guy hadn't decided, okay, the jig is up, I'm getting stopped by the police, they must know what I did, and decided to shoot it out with the police officer instead, this poor copper, unaware, could have been killed. We might never have known mm-hmm. who this guy was, you know, and, oh, it just ticked me off that this poor copper was, life was put in jeopardy over what I Deemed to be incompetence. Yes. Do you know what the uh, what the pretext was for the traffic stop? Uh, yeah, he was from Illinois. <laughs> yeah, the Illinois place in Wisconsin. <laughs> that's now that's what the that's what the copper told us. The West Dallas mm-hmm. police officer told us. Um, but of course, it was like he ran a stop sign or something. You know. Did Patrick say that too when you talked to him? Uh, no, <laughs> no. You got Illinois tags. You're going to jail. Yeah. Well, in Wisconsin. In Wisconsin, they call us Illinois people FIBS, F-I-B-S, freaking Illinois bastards. <laughs> well, but they're not using the word freaking. <laughs> oh, yeah. So see how educational Game of Crime is? Yeah. <laughs> I've never heard that before. Yeah. Uh, you know, I was reading about this also. Um, that guy left, uh, he left some of his casings, his 22 casings at the judge's house. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, so, um, so that, there was a there was a wealth of evidence to connect him. Yeah, fingerprints, the, the bloody yeah. footprints, everything. Yeah, what an idiot. Yeah, yeah. You know, some people are just not made to be criminals. Just, <laughs> uh, he was he was all about vengeance for what he thought was uh, unjust treatment and and being disfigured by his surgeons. Yeah, and it's you know not to make a joke of somebody's death, but it sounds like a country song. You know, you done did me wrong. Yeah, really. Yeah. But if you know, on our uh, Game of Crimes, we also have a Patreon subscriber channel, and and um, my co-host was Morgan uh, Wright, who we would talk about different cases. We call them Case of the Month, and we took a look one time at judges being attacked in the United States, and it's not something that just rarely, rarely ever happens. Holy cow! I, I found one in uh, let's see, this was where was this at? Washington County, Maryland where uh, the shot the, the judge was shot in the driveway of his home while his wife and son were inside the house. Another one in Hagerstown, Maryland, December 89. Uh, uh, it was He was sent a package, and it contained a pipe bomb that went off and blew up in his hands. In 2020, in New Jersey, uh, U.S. District Court Judge Esther Salas, the guy came in and shot her 20-year-old son and wounded her husband. Never got to her. Uh, Wisconsin, June 2022. Joe Joe uh, Romer was killed in his home. He was a Wisconsin County Circuit Judge, and the list just keeps going and going. And, he, and you know, I mean, you know, most people probably never think about it because judges, it's almost like they're unapproachable. Yeah. yeah, and they're the ones that have to make the final decision. And so, if you stop and really give it some consideration, you know, I always got mad at judges when they didn't rule in my favor, but. You know, it wasn't personal. They were just, they were interpreting the law the way they saw what was right and wrong. Exactly. Yeah. I and agree. you're the investigator and you've got, you know, you've got hours and, and time and, and effort and experience and all this other evidence that you've built and they rule against you. It just takes you off a little bit. It's not something that lasts. But when you stop and think about it, they're, they are the ones that are probably facing as much danger, if not more than anybody else, because there's the one saying life. Absolutely. And in these days of the internet, it's not hard to find somebody's address. Yeah. I and mean, that's how this Bart Ross found Judge Lefkow's address was off the internet, you know, in 05. And that was, you know, how big was the internet back then in 05? Not like it is today. But yeah. he still was able to get her address. Yeah. 
And, it, and, and, you know, we're seeing like there's more and more acts of violence. You know, I, whether you like Nancy Pelosi or not, her husband didn't deserve to almost be killed by somebody breaking in his house. Absolutely. Absolutely. Um, so it's 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 crazy what's going on out there. Um, and, you know, to judge uh, Lefkow, um sorry for what happened to you. You know, it's, it certainly didn't need to happen. I mean, your mom was obviously innocent as well as your husband. Just they, and not to simplify the matter, but we're in the wrong place at the wrong time. So our hearts go out to you for your loss there. So now that was in 05 and you retired from Chicago PD when? Uh, in 06, about a year and a half later. Uh, a couple of concerns. I was only 53 when I retired. Mm -hmm. I had 29 on though, so more than enough time. Um, my wife was disabled, uh, is disabled, and um, I wanted to spend more time with her. Excellent. Um, so that's why I did it. I had the time. I, I thought I could probably catch maybe another promotion or two if I stayed on, but you got to evaluate what's more important to you at the time, right? And my wife was more important. Well, that's our regular listeners here. We talk about this all the time, how in law enforcement, we tend to, and, and not just law enforcement, there's other jobs as well. Maybe not firemen, but uh, they're firemen, you know. So love you, firemen. <laughs> Got to take a shot when I can. Heroes. <laughs> but how many times do we put the job before our families? Huh. Like the huh. whole lifetime, the whole career yeah. is the way it pretty, yeah. pretty much works out. And, you know, now I, I've been retired now almost 11 years, and, and I say that I want to put the family first. But, you know, the truth is I've, I'm still putting the job. It's, you know, the podcast, my partner and I, we have a speaking business. There's a few other projects we work on. And I, I'm trying to spend more time with my wife or kids are out now. And, and, you know, we want to see grandkids and things like that. But it's it's hard to change that that you know, what we've grown up in 29 years is a long time to do that. And then all of a sudden to yeah. stop and go the other way, it, it takes yeah. a concerted effort. It's yeah. A focus. Um, yeah, it was, it was, it was tough. And uh, after, after I retired about six months later, we moved down here to Florida and uh, in the Sarasota area. And uh, after a little while, I got antsy too. I did, mm -hmm. you know, but you know, but I was still close to home and I was, I took a job teaching at a small local university, a uh, private university, uh, teaching crime scene investigation, which um, I knew. You know, that was about that time where all these CSI shows were coming on TV. Yeah. So yeah. all these kids thought, oh, I'm going to be wearing Gucci, Gucci uh, suits and driving Ferraris and uh, working crime scenes. Well, sorry, kids. I told them first day. Nope, that's not what's going to happen. You'll be lucky if you're making thirty thousand dollars a year. <laughs> well, you know, back in my day, I was when I was a a, a, a city cop, a railroad cop. I was watching Miami Vice, and I thought, man, I'm joining the DEA. I'm going to have the fast boats, yeah. the fancy cars. I'm still waiting on all that to happen. <laughs> yeah. Hey, the Jetsons promise us flying cars. We still don't have flying cars. <laughs> I love it. So, <laughs> can you say the university that you you, you were teaching at? At Kaiser University. Kaiser. Uh, yeah, it's a small local university, private, um, still in business, but they're not a private university anymore. They were a private for-profit university, mm -hmm. which was the problem. And it really irritated me because there were a lot of kids there that shouldn't have been, that that um, should not have been uh, in college. In fact, should have gone back to high school and learned how to read. They This is one of the reasons why I left that, that uh, position was because they were taking a lot of these kids, loading them up on student loans mm -hmm. so they could pay for their classes. And uh, I'm like, this is not right. You, you, you can't do that to these kids. You know, you're saddling them with sixty, eighty thousand dollars $80,000 worth of student loans yeah. to take a job as a $30,000 a year um, um, crime civilian scene crime scene investigator. And there's yeah. not that many jobs down here to begin with in, in Florida where they're going to be hired at, you know? It's, mm -hmm. it's, yeah. So it's like they, the university did get in trouble for um, their student loan problems, uh, loading up a lot of these kids on student loans and uh, had to give up uh, control and uh, went from a for-profit university. They were allowed to keep their, their accreditation, but they had to give up being a private for-profit university. They're now a public university. Gotcha. 
Gotcha. And I'd heard of Kaiser University. I didn't know any of the background on that. I, I had no idea it was a for-profit. In fact, I'm not even sure I knew that there were universities that are for-profit. But now that I think of it, you see, it, it's, it's like these little, small, almost virtual universities pop up. And yeah. Makes you wonder. Yeah. Makes you yeah. wonder. So now you, you're already in Florida at that point? Yes. Yes. Okay. And after well, you did that, now, I understand you got into something that you've been passionate about, something you wanted to do your whole life. Tell us a little that, bit more about that. That's right. I uh, I started writing. Well, I've I've always written and always dreamed of being a published author for you know as long as I can remember, but um, I never really paid serious attention to the craft uh, until uh, some years ago. I had a, a a book I had been writing on and off for years. And uh, I thought, I don't know, you know, this probably isn't good good enough to get published. It's not bad, but it's, you know, you start looking at how you get published and you start looking, oh, I got to find an agent, got to start querying publishers and going through that whole route. And um, I had another friend, another retired copper, and uh, he's like, no, you don't have to do all that. I just published a book. I was like, what? <laughs> yeah. He was, Here, go on Amazon. I look on Amazon and, and he, he published a book. Through Amazon, they were self-publishing. Back then, it was called Create Space. Now it's KDP, Kindle Direct Publishing. And um, he's like, "No, you you can publish your book yourself. You don't have to do all that, you know." And Amazon pays you direct. Just you're, you're splitting profits with them. I was like, "I can't believe this." So I I researched that and I said, "Yeah, I can." Boom! I banged out the first book, and I published it, and it it did fairly well, not great. And I thought, "Well, this is great. I, I'm going to keep doing this." And uh, wrote three more books since then uh, in the same series about a uh, disgraced retired copper um, living in Florida. <laughs> um, and um, it, it does fairly well. And um, recently, through our mutual friend, Pat O'Donnell, I, I found out about the 20 books um, self-publishing formula and uh, wound up going to their conference in Vegas and met a few people there. and. Um, that again led to me uh, um, learning about Vinci Books, and they are the brainchild of uh, James Blatch, who um, began the self-publishing formula podcast and uh, Facebook page to help self-published authors sell their work, how to, how to promote yourself, because um, that's the biggest problem. Writing the book is the easy part. Promoting it and selling it is the hard part. Yeah. And, you know, when you have a publisher, they handle all that for you. You mm -hmm. don't have to worry about that. Now, you give them a big part of your profits, your royalties for doing that, but they handle it all for you. All you got to worry about is writing your book. Well, the self-publishing formula teaches self-published authors how to do that for themselves. But there's also a big group of self-published authors who, don't, who still don't want to do that. You know, it's like that takes up every day for the rest of your life trying to sell a book. Mm -hmm. So they began uh, Vinci Books, formerly Fuse Books, but now Vinci Books. And what they're doing is it's for self-published authors. They will do the promotion for you. And yes, you split the royalties with them. Um, so I recently signed with them. They offered me a contract. I signed with them. And now I'm being represented by Vinci Books. And it's a, it's a great deal for self-published authors. But they have some some serious requirements from you. And one of those is that you have a series. You have at least three or four books in your series that you're getting good reviews on your books. And it's not just some crap you're slapping together and, and putting on Amazon. So they liked my books and uh, offered me a contract and now they'll be publishing my books. But uh, Very nice. Yeah. And I've got a couple more in the pipeline, a couple more books in the pipeline that they're going to handle for me. And uh, we'll go from there. We'll see. I haven't gotten a check from them yet. <laughs> <laughs> Checks in the mail, brother. <laughs> <laughs> well, I, you know, I just signed this past month with them. So that what they're doing is they're recovering all my books, new professional looking covers, and uh, they're going to check them and make sure if they uh, need any re-editing, and uh, then they'll be republishing them on Amazon. So I just finished reading The Green Line, your latest yeah. book, I think, on, in the uh, Sam Laska series. Is that the new cover, or is that the color you came up no, with? No, that's the old cover. That's the cover I came up with. Uh, it um, looks pretty good to me. It's the L yeah. subway system in Chicago, right? Yeah. Uh, that's the uh, elevated line, yeah. Yeah, it's. Uh, it, it looks to me very professional. Well, thank you. Um, but 
So I, I understand that through looking at your website, you've got four books now in the Sam Laska series. Correct. Uh, and then you've got a, a set of short stories from Sam when, when he was back in uniform. Yes. Um, but I just unpublished those oh. because Vinci Books now has the rights to everything Sam Lasko. So gotcha. I have to I have to present that to them and see if they want to republish it. Um, so I pulled it down off of Amazon. The, it's a short book of uh, short stories, only about 90 pages. Gotcha. But the other books, the, the four book series is still available? That's correct. Through Amazon. Yeah. I was going to say, if you pulled it, I just got the book. Uh, I think it got here Friday. But that's the thing about the book. Uh, when I first started, I, as soon as I got it, I got it and sat down and started reading and then the phone rings. And then somebody comes to the front door yeah. and my wife wants yeah. to do something. And I got through like 20 pages and I thought, man, I'm never going to finish this book before we do this <laughs> interview today. And I've got it yesterday. We had some quiet time after church, and I sat down and finished the book last night before I went to bed. Yeah. Oh, it's, uh, oh. it's, Hope you enjoyed it. I loved it. I loved it. The uh, there's, in fact, there was two things that I even put tabs in here that you can tell somebody writing the book has to have been there and done that uh, to know about this. And it, you're talking about where Sam, the good guy, is talking to this attorney, Burnett. Mal I think Malcolm Burnett was his name. Yeah, that's correct. Yeah. And it's the first time he's talked to him. And we've Morgan and I have talked about this several times where when you're talking to somebody in an official capacity, you can you ask them a question and then let them answer and then don't say anything. Even when they finish, just sit there for a minute. Because people right. and Morgan used to do this to me online on air all the time. He'd say something and then he'd just stop and we're looking at each other and I'm thinking, This is dead space that we we can't have dead space on the podcast. And I start talking. Yeah. It's like, see, it works every time. Yeah. It's it's human nature to fill that void, you know? It you, is. And, and, and people feel you know, compelled to talk more. Seasoned coppers, seasoned homicide detectives. I'm going to get the ball rolling, then I'm going to sit back and listen. And if it, if you go quiet, I'm just going to sit here and stay quiet and let you fill that void. Yep. And then uh, where you had some uh, bullets that were recovered. You submitted the projectiles to NIBUS, the National Integrated Bullet Identification System, which is a really, that's a real thing. It's where they yeah. do, they store all the information, they test ballistics and yeah. all that kind of stuff. So I love that you're putting real life stuff in there. You know, the police officer is a former CPD guy that was, uh, I don't know why he was disgraced, but it sounds like that's, he kind of went out under a little bit of a cloud. Yeah, a little bit, but, and it was actually a funny story. Do we have time for it? Sure. Because it was based on a real event. Uh -oh. um, um, what happened with uh, the real event was we had a, uh, this is when I was the lieutenant in homicide up in Area 3 on the north side of the city. We had a shooting at a nightclub. Uh, five people shot, three of them dead. One of the ones dead was a security guard who worked the door. And uh, it was a gang shootout inside this club. Right. Somebody recognized somebody else, boom, boom, boom. People started opening up. Now, it's it's all chaos. We don't know uh, who's who, but one of the coppers recognized, oh, hey, this is a leader from a local gang here. So we grab him. Uh, he's being evasive. Okay, give him to the wagon crew, our, uh, our transport wagon crew. Take him over to our area headquarters, and our detectives are going to interview him there. You know, mm -hmm. keep him handcuffed. Um, behind his back, because we're going to do a GSR test on him to see if he fired a weapon. GSR, gonna, uh, gunshot residue test. Thank we're going to we're going to wipe his hands um, to see if there's uh, any of the uh, uh, chemical uh, residue from a gunshot, uh, which would indicate he was close to or or fired a weapon. So wagon crew takes him away. Uh, when I and the detectives come back, they walk in the room and. Uh, He's unhandcuffed and peeing on his hands, washing his hands in his own urine. Well, and this is real life. This is not your book. That, that's real life. That's real life. But I use that story as the basis for why Sam Laska had to leave the police department because Sam Laska does the same thing. He comes back in after the transport crew dropped him off, he walks in, the guy's peeing on his own hands to wash him. So he, you know, pushes the guy away to stop him from doing that. The guy punches Sam. Sam punches him back. The guy's head hits the, the wall, he has a concussion, and almost dies. Oops. So kind of uh, an excessive force complaint against him. He's getting sued over it. So the police department told him, listen, retire or get fired. Mm -hmm. Your choice. So he retired. 
Ah, there you go. <laughs> so, but yeah, the book that I read, real about, events. <laughs> based yeah. on real events. The the book I read in the series is the Green Line, which is the most recent book. This is the fourth in a four book series. You know, and and why would I start at the beginning? I you know I don't know. I I told, I told Rick. <laughs> When uh, our guests on here, I try to at least read one of their books before we have them on the show. Yeah. And you've heard me say this before. I did not read this much in college. I mean, it's, <laughs> I got, yeah. you can't see it, but I mean, there's rows and rows of books behind me uh, of things I've read. And I've probably got five others uh, laying on the desk behind me right now that I've got to get to. But uh, I want to ask you one more thing about before we finish up all your time in law enforcement, you saw a lot of things that a lot of coppers never see. And, 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 when we say coppers, that's what you guys call each other in Chicago, yeah, right? Absolutely, yeah. Yeah, I learned that from my cousin. So you've seen all this death and, and mayhem and torture and violence, you know, go walking in to see the bodies and then having to investigate and then having to meet with families who are traumatized by the death of loved ones. All the, the mess, the bad, negative things that go along with being a homicide investigator. Did you ever suffer any personal trauma, traumatic feelings from that, uh, post-traumatic stress syndrome, whatever you want to call it. Do, have you had nightmares because of it? I don't know anybody, any copper who doesn't suffer from some type or some level of PTSD. Mm -hmm. I think we all do um, from those things we've seen. And yes, I do. I still have nightmares about a couple of cases, one in particular, which wasn't even a murder. It was an accidental death uh, of a little nine-year-old girl. I, I see her all the time in my dreams. Um, so, yeah, we, we, we do that. I do that. I have some, I, I think it's mild PTSD, but uh, every once in a while you'll see something or hear something or someone will say something. It'll bring back a memory. Mm -hmm. um, it'll, it'll, it'll flash back to you. And I've had my wife a few times look at me and say, what, you know, what are you, what are you remembering? You know, it's like, in fact, very late in my career. Um, right before I retired, I had a little tiff with my wife and what aggravated her was she said, you know, in all these years, all these years we've been married, you never talk about the job. You've never told me anything. You come home, you're depressed or, or, um, you're quiet all night. You, you don't tell me anything. You, you should share this and open up. I said, no, I don't want to do that. I don't want you to suffer the same memories that I do, um, or have to carry that burden. And she's like, no, no, I want to, I want to, I told her one story and, um, she's like, okay, never tell me again. Yeah. It's like, yeah. So we all do. I think we all do. We all suffer, um, PTSD. Some guys, I, I think you're not human if you don't, if you don't have some feelings. And, uh, so yeah, we, we do. Um, and every Everybody has a different way of dealing with it. Mm -hmm. um, some guys are deep into the bottle, and, yeah. and that's a shame. Other guys, you know, they're whistling past the graveyard. They're joking and laughing about it. Um, but deep down, you know, they're, they're, they feel the same way about it as you do. Other guys just never want to talk about it. Never. Mm -hmm. And I was that guy. I was the guy that never wants to talk about it um, or go over it. Um, like a lot of my war stories will be funny or uh, or of a lighter vein um when when i talk about the really horrible evil things that you've seen um it's just too depressing i don't want to relive that again in a war story you know that's not why i'm sitting in the bar having a beer with you to talk about that stuff you know let's talk about the guy who pissed on his hands to get rid of the gsr you know <laughs> that's a good story i gotta say <laughs> so in in chicago pd during your time did they have uh, counselors that you could go talk to? Was it mandatory? Was it voluntary? It wasn't mandatory back then. Um, it is now after a police involved shooting. Um, they'll, they'll give you uh, days off uh, and uh, have you see the counselor. Back when I was doing it, they did have department psychiatrists you can go talk to, but nobody wanted to because right. I think, well, this guy is going to go tell the bosses right away. You know, there was no HIPAA back then. Yep. Um, that would protect you. Um, so, and, and it's funny, I know you don't know about this, but it's funny you're bringing all this up because my latest book, it's a whole new different series, um, is, is basically about this. And it's actually a paranormal 
cop thriller um, where it's a homicide detective who suffers an injury, died on the table and was brought back, and he's back to work now, and he discovers his the dead victims are talking to him. He can talk to dead people. Only homicide victims, though, and only for a short while while he's there on the scene with them. Um, and he goes to see a private psychiatrist about this. Now, now, he totally believes these dead people are talking to him. That's not his problem. The problem is he's getting to know them as people before they were a piece of evidence, a piece of meat on the ground. He didn't know anything about them, didn't care to know anything about them, wasn't familiar with them. It's like you're watching on TV and you hear about the car bomb that killed four people. Mm-hmm. Well, two minutes later when they're doing the weather, you forgot about those people already. Same thing with a lot of homicide investigators is they'll, they'll put it out of their mind. They won't think about it. But now this cop who can talk to dead people is getting to know these people. He's getting friendly with them as they're dead. And it's, that's what's affecting him. Oh, so. I, I, I can't imagine. Holy cow. So uh, do, you, do you run these ideas by your wife? Yeah, I do. Yeah, I do. She's my biggest fan. <laughs> and, and does she and think you need about. counseling? Uh, <laughs> she's never said that. <laughs> She, she's never said that. Um, <laughs> you know, that you come up with these ideas? I mean, where where, where in the world does that come from? You know, um, like people have told me, oh, well, you know, talking to dead people, that's been done before, like the Sixth Sense with uh, um, with uh, Willis. And I said, well, yeah, it has. But are there any new stories? Exactly. I mean, even murder mysteries. I mean, there's only so many ways to kill somebody. Yeah. Um, you know, it's it's – Books these days are all character driven. It's all about the characters. You know, it's yeah. like, yeah, there's a murder to solve or, you know, there's a terrorist um, cell to break up and get the bad guys and all this. But basically it's about the characters. You got to, you got to fall in love with the characters. Even the yeah. bad guys, you have to fall in love with the bad guys. Yep. Yeah. It's, and it's interesting to hear about the, you know, in DEA, my partner was shot in 89. We got in a shootout down in Miami and, he was hit twice and, and survived, but the informant was shot right in the throat and, and he never made it to the trauma center. What a shame. And I've, you know, in 38 years as a cop, I was involved in a lot of shootings that they never bothered me except the one where my partner got shot. Right. And, it, and yeah. it's funny because, you know, he was off for a year, uh, came back on the job. His right arm is still, he got hit twice with 45 caliber slugs Oof. in the right arm and survived, kept his arm. It's kind of screwed up. But, he and I never really talked about the shooting. We were close, closest friends. Uh, he was single. My wife has always been where if you're my partner, uh, you are family, you know, which is traditional in law enforcement culture. And the first time he and I, he and I ever talked about it was here on the Game of Crimes podcast when Morgan mm-hmm. was still here with me. And Morgan led the conversation. And the way we remembered that day was completely different. Uh, and I think it stunned Morgan that he and I had never even sat down and discussed the shooting that day, but it's, I don't know, it's just part of it. Yeah, I, I can see that. I can see that. Um, well, we were we were all the same as you guys. We were afraid to go talk to a psychologist or a psychiatrist because we thought they'd go back to management and tell our stories. Yeah, yeah absolutely. And so I never went to counseling, yeah. and I had I had dreams about Kevin shooting until the day I retired. I haven't had any shooting, any more dreams about Kevin. They weren't nightmares. It was just reliving it. Over yeah. and over, you know, yeah. and you wake up thinking, what could I have done and all that kind of stuff. But so anyway, interesting to hear. But so we, where can people find your books? Uh, on Amazon, you can uh, just search my name um, and they'll they'll come right up. Uh, and uh, I do have a, a Facebook page, the Sam Laska Crime Thrillers uh, Facebook page. And uh, I have my own website, um, rribickyauthor.com. And you spell Rybicki for us? R-Y, B like in boy, I-C-K-I. Yep. And it's, uh, and Laska is L-A-S-K-A, so it's Sam Laska. Instagram, I found you on, and Richard Rybicki, I found you on um, X, which is formerly Twitter, and yeah. Richard Rybicki. Uh, I don't, LinkedIn, same, Richard Rybicki. Uh, I don't go on those too often. Uh, no. I'm going to, I'm going to let Vinci Books do it. I did it all for, you know, promoting my books. I'm going to let Vinci Books handle that for me now. Big shout yeah. out to them. <laughs> very good. Very good. So, uh, Rick, it's been an honor to have you on here. And thank you for, for going into detail on some of these stories, uh, giving us this insight um, into a big police department. You know, how what you're talking about is how strong your work ethic was, is what got you promoted up through the ranks. Yes. Um, and that's, you know, for anybody out there who's thinking about going into law enforcement, don't go into it for the wrong reasons. If you're not out there to help people and do your damn job, go find something else to do. 
because once you put that badge on, you are a public servant, and the responsibility is in the title. You're there to serve the public. Uh, if you want to be dead wood, go do something else. The public needs all the help they can get, and it's it, it's a very honorable profession. Uh, not everybody is called to. That's right. There are a lot of openings in the food service and sanitation industry. <laughs> <laughs> oh, I love the way you put that to you. That's a great way to end it, right? <laughs> all right, Rick. So if you will, stand by. Don't hang, don't go anywhere. And for all our listeners out there, stand by for the debrief. Hey, gang. Now, don't take this as me bragging, but I am so impressed with the guests we have on Game of Crimes. And you know what? Today's guest, Rick, he's no exception. What I really appreciate about our guests is their transparency, their honesty, their willingness to open up, tell us details about their private lives, as well as about their professional careers. Now, you and I, we all see what's going on in Chicago these days. Can you imagine spending 29 years with the Chicago Police Department? What a challenging career. I know Rick's been retired for several years now, but you know it wasn't that much different during his days on the job. I'm sure it was just as dangerous then as it is now. Here's what I think the real difference is, and I think it's that the Chicago Police Department executive management, the courts, and especially the city government were more pro-law enforcement back in that day, and they stood behind their people. Not like it is today where we're still hearing things like defund the police, abolish law enforcement. Just think about that for a minute. In what world does that even sound logical? If you don't think that's the way, if you don't think that that way of thinking is an organized movement to create chaos and mayhem in our communities, to tear down our way of life and tenets that this country was founded on, to get rid of the values that made our country the greatest in the world, please, please do some research to educate yourself and see what's really happening here. I mean, look at what Chicago is doing to handcuff and restrict their own police department. You know, I'm fine with the review board looking at allegations against police officers when that's truly founded and based on facts, not innuendos and guesses, what somebody thinks without even looking into it. But don't you think it'd be a good idea to have people on that board who have actually and personally experienced similar events? Man, I'm telling you, that's not what's happening in Chicago today. And as I've always said, don't accept what I say is the truth. I'm asking you, do your own research and you decide what you think is right and wrong. You've heard me say this before on here. Don't let our politicians, anybody else, including me, tell you how to think. And especially don't let the media tell you what your thoughts should be. We're all intelligent people. We can review the topic and decide for ourselves what we think, right? Why can't the media just report the damn news without putting their slant on it? Okay, okay. I'm sorry I'm getting a little carried away here. This crap just drives me crazy. Well, you know what? Maybe this would be a good topic for Patreon. Yeah, we'll have to take a look at that. Well, let's get back to Rick here. And brother, thank you for your service to the citizens of Chicago and Cook County, County, Illinois. I mean, you're a hero of my eyes, brother. You heard Rick's response about almost all police officers dealing with some form of PTSD, stress, anxiety, whatever you want to call it, and how they deal with it. Honestly, I can't imagine being a homicide detective in Chicago, seeing all those bodies, the depravity of man, the heinous acts that people commit against each other, and not going away with a different view of mankind. You know, maybe having a jaded or a jaundiced view of other people. Oh, heck, I I came away from DEA like that. Our law enforcement professionals are dedicated to helping others. That's what keeps them motivated to keep on going. That's what motivated me. Well, that and the excitement on the job. But that's what I loved hearing about Rick's story here. Here's a guy moving up in the ranks. He's been recognized for his hard work, his expertise, his willingness to get involved in there, you know, to jump in and get his hands dirty. But he decided to put his family first, to take care of his wife and pursue another passion that he'd always uh, wanted to check into. You know, I said at the beginning of Rick's episode, that's not common in the law enforcement culture. We tend to put the job first, and then, unfortunately, everything else comes after that. So, Rick, my hat's off to you there, mister. We heard Rick talk about the John Lefkow case. Now, if you remember, I'm sorry, Joan Lefkow. Joan was a federal district court judge who was targeted for murder by a guy who she ruled against in a proceeding. 
Of course, things didn't go right. Now, I would call it Murphy's Law, but I don't want to. I don't want to make a joke out of this. Things didn't go right for the guy, and he ended up killing Joan's husband and her 89-year-old mother. Now, Judge Lefkow, she was unharmed during that investigation because the intended target was a federal judge. The FBI became involved in the case. I don't need to go over all the details again here, but Rick talked about how the FBI investigators, who most likely had little, if any, experience in homicide investigations, they developed tunnel vision, and they weren't interested in looking at other potential suspects. And as it turns out, you know what? The Chicago coppers were right. I mean, these are experienced homicide investigators. Let them do their jobs. Now, you've heard me and others on the show give the FBI a hard time about different things, and most of that was in jest. You know, that's that's one thing that all cops have in common. We like to pick on the Bureau. However, there are times when this criticism is justified. But here's the thing. It's not limited to just, to just the FBI. I've met cops and agents from a multitude of agencies, and everyone has assholes in their ranks, including DEA. As much as I love DEA, I've met several of those people along my career. So don't lump all FBI agents into the same shit basket here. We've all got people that we'd prefer that they go work somewhere else. Those are the people you volunteer, you volunteer to go on these special assignments. Now, Rick, is he's now pursuing the passion of writing, and it certainly sounds like he's doing very well with it, doesn't it? He's created a series of books centered around a retired Chicago police officer. I read his latest book in the series, The Green Line. I tell you what, I did enjoy it very much. It's one of those books that once you start reading it, you can't put it down. And now Rick's got a contract with Vinci Books of London. Wow. I got to say, man, I love hearing about law enforcement retirees who move on to new adventures in their life, what I call life after DEA or life after Chicago PD or life after whatever agency they work for, and they become successful at it. So, Rick, great job, brother. Keep it up. Keep it up. And as I always like to say, God bless the men and women in law enforcement. Please keep them safe. Now, we're coming up on the end here. I hope you enjoyed today's episode with Rick Rybecki. Check him out on his website at rrybecki, R-Y, so this is R-R-Y-B-I-C-K-I, author, A-U-T-H-O-R.com. And on social media, all the different social media platforms at Richard Rybecki. And again, Rybecki is R-Y-B-I-C-K-I. I'll post his book, The Green Line, on the Game of Crimes website book page, so you'll have a link to it there, and then you can find all his other books. Hearing these stories from people like Rick and other guests, you know what? Again, that's what keeps me motivated to promote these real-life heroes, not just in law enforcement profession, but also our military veterans and all first responders. And I'm going to continue to recognize the unsung heroes in all this, and that's our families. God bless you all. Very quickly now, go to Apple or Spotify, click on those five stars. Not sure why it works, but it does. You can leave comments on Spotify. Let me know what you think about the show. Also, head over to GameofCrimesPodcast.com, our website. That's where you find all our information about the shows, all the episodes, the book list, and more. Follow the show on social media. That's on Facebook and Instagram at Game of Crimes Podcast, and on X, formerly Twitter, at Game of Crimes. Also on Facebook. Go to Game of Crimes fan page run by our favorite mafia queen, Miss Sandy Salvato, who rules with the iron fist, but she wears the velvet glove. Why do we say that? Because we love her. That's why. The people in that group, they are just fantastic. Go over and read some hilarious things and see how they look out for each other. Now, do me a huge favor. Tell all your friends about Game of Crimes. Tell them to come on over down to the show and let's give us a listen. As I said always, the best advertising and marketing in the podcast world is word of mouth. And that's the truth. I believe me, Morgan and I did a lot of research, and that is what the best uh, means of communicating is. I'll do what I can to promote the show, but your efforts and, and are much more effective than mine, so I appreciate you helping me to spread the word about the best weekly true crime podcast available. Am I a little prejudiced about that? Yeah, I guess so. As always, thank you guys again for continuing to support the game of crimes. Remember, we can all have different ideas and differences of opinions, But that doesn't mean we can't continue to be friends, right? Finally, thank you all once again for joining me to play the biggest, the baddest, the most dangerous game of all, the Game of Crimes. I'll see y'all next time.